Welcome everybody to this Arise Festival discussion on Biden's presidency. My name's Steve Howell. I'm a former journalist who then worked in comms, including a spell for Jeremy Corbyn when he was leader of the Labour Party. I, I now mainly write books, political thrillers and political non-fiction, and I do my best not to get them mixed up. It's a real privilege to be chairing this with three great panelists from the United States. Three people are in the thick of the fight for progressive policies and peace. Firstly, Nina Turner, former Ohio State Senator, Bernie Sanders 2020 campaign co-chair, a board member of the grassroots progressive movement, Our Revolution, and generally uh, she's a self-confessed hellraiser when it comes to fighting for working people. Welcome, Nina. Medea Benjamin. Medea is a, a peace activist, an author, and the co-founder of the women-led peace group Code Pink and of the human rights group Global Exchange. In 2000, she was a Green Party candidate for the California State Senate. Thanks for joining us, Medea. And finally, David Sirota. David's a journalist by trade. He was uh, a speech writer for Bernie Sanders in his 2020 presidential campaign. Since then, he set up The Lever, a media outlet that digs into the dark corners of US politics and holds power accountable, well worth checking out. Uh, and just as a mere sideline, he's turned his hand to screenwriting as the co-writer of Don't Look Up, a great movie for which he was nominated for an Oscar. Now, I just want us to cast our minds back for a moment to 2020 and the early part of that uh, year. The Democratic primaries were underway. I was in L.A. Uh, on Sunday, the 1st of March 2020 at a huge rally for Bernie Sanders. Uh, something like 25,000 people. I've posted a clip of it on Twitter. Um, and it was just two days before Super Tuesday. And Bernie was the front runner at that point for the presidential nomination. And that Friday, the New York Times had run a story saying Democratic leaders were willing to risk party damage to stop Sanders. Uh, and that's something we are very familiar with, especially this week uh, in Britain with uh, what happened to Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, and suddenly, over that weekend, candidates started dropping like flies and endorsing Biden, which was unprecedented on the eve of uh, Super Tuesday. These were viable candidates who normally would have seen Super Tuesday as an opportunity uh, to make their mark in, I think it's 14 primaries that take place on that day. Um, and th them withdrawing uh, gave Biden just enough oxygen uh, to do better uh, on Super Tuesday than uh, he would otherwise have done. Uh, and then with COVID spreading rapidly, a few weeks later, Bernie decided he couldn't win the nomination and suspended his campaign while keeping his name on the ballot paper in the remaining uh, primaries, because having delegates at the convention gave him leverage over the Democratic platform or manifesto, as we would call it in Britain, um, and he did manage at the convention to sec secure some concessions, uh, such as, uh, I mean, actually, Biden was a bit of a policy free zone, I think it's fair to say. Um, and he had said early in the campaign, nothing would change uh, under him. Uh, but uh, Bernie and his team forced through some concessions on a number of issues, such as the $15 minimum wage, um, not the full shilling on health care, but uh, a concession uh, to have a public op uh, option, uh, measures to tackle climate change, ending forever wars. All these things were in the um, democratic platform. And these concessions were supposed to sweeten the pill of having to back someone who for 50 years had been a pillar of the democratic establishment in order to stop Trump winning a second term. So the question is, how's that going um, after two years? How does that pill taste now, two years into Biden, Biden's presidency. What has he delivered in terms of those promises? And if he hasn't delivered, uh, why not? And what is the left and the progressive movement in the United States doing about it? And uh, to kick it off, I'm, I'll turn to you, David, to uh, to give us your your headline thoughts on that. Well, look, I think that Joe Biden, uh, you know, he campaigned as the guy who was knew how to get things done. Uh, he campaigned on a relatively progressive, uh, officially a relatively progressive agenda, although I think I think it is fair to say that he campaigned 
as the way to get rid of Trump. And um, he basically, um, he barely won the election. Uh, and I do think out of the gate, he was successful in um, passing a very robust spending package that was uh, good, and it it made a lot of um, it made it it made a lot of temporary progress. And we wrote we reported at the lever that um, the uh, programs that he put in place in that bill, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, actually succeeded in driving down the number of Americans who said that they were economically struggling to survive. Um, uh, the, unfortunately, those those programs were most of them were temporary. We're talking about things like the child tax credit and the like, uh, and that number has shot back up. Uh, that number of people saying uh, that they're economically struggling to survive uh, has has severely increased recently. So I think out of the gate there was. Um, there was reason to feel um, some optimism that he had learned the lesson from the Biden administration, from the Obama administration, the lesson being don't go too small uh, on the stimulus stuff, uh, but that since then, uh, there hasn't really been much of anything. Now, I know the argument is, is that uh, there are these two senators, uh, Manchin and Cinema, who are blocking everything, and um, uh, that's the that's the real problem. But he hasn't taken a slew of executive actions on climate change, student debt, uh, uh, ending the drug war, and the like. Uh, he hasn't really put much pressure at all, at least publicly, on his own party to use its power to pass things. And so here we are at a time where we've got uh, 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 wages are not keeping up with inflation. We have a larger inflation problem, uh, and um, Biden's numbers are at near historic lows for a sitting president. Uh, and we're only a couple months from the midterms. And I think that, that people are rightly unhappy with what's going on in the world, what's going on in the country, uh, and what's going on in the government. And I think that the reason that we've seen in the United States, uh, this pattern of um, elections that keep uh, going back and forth between the parties is because people keep voting for change, and they keep getting more of the same. And I think that that seems to be the mood right now heading into heading into the election. Nina, do you want to pick, pick up yeah. on that? I, I'm, I'm taking it from what David said, a, a big tick in the box in the early days, some optimistic signs, but it's been downhill since. Yeah, I mean, I'm just really amening everything David had to say. I don't believe that this president or this Congress, I don't believe that they're bold enough for the moment. Uh, there is certainly promise in the problem. This is the, the greatest opportunity in a long time to really go extremely hard, go extremely bold, have a vision that provides provision for the people. But there's a lack of intestinal fortitude uh, with this president and also with this Congress. And that lack of intestinal fortitude has a ripple effect to every other man, woman, child, person, the environment, the entire ecosystem is going to be impacted by their lack of courage. And the fact that the owner donors still are very much in charge, whether we're talking about domestic policy or international policy, it is very clear who controls the levers of power besides the shadow president, Senator Joe Manchin and his shadow vice president, Senator Sinema, one has to wonder, there has to be more people. It's not just those two that are thwarting progress. There are other people within that Congress who are thwarting progress too, and they are very comfortable with hiding behind a mansion and cinema and let them be the bad guy and the bad gal on this while they sit comfortably and allow millions and millions of people to suffer. There are about 140 million people in this country who are living in poverty or right there on the line. They are suffering every single day because we do not have elected officials who are willing to act on their behalf. So as David laid out, you know, all of the great gains at the beginning are gone. I mean, how do you allow the, tax, the child tax credit, for example, to expire and not be permanent? If we can lift almost 50, you know, lift 
uh, children out of poverty, that means you're lifting their families and their communities out of poverty. How do you in good consciousness let that languish and go away? They're right back where they started from. People can't afford gas. They can't afford their food. And see, the people who are at the helm right now, they really don't give a damn. And you know why they don't? Because they're going to be all right. Them, their children, and their children's children, they're going to be just okay. But the people in the hoods, whether it's the rural hoods, the urban hoods, the sub suburban hoods, where they are misunderstood, them and their children are not going to be okay. So we have a crisis of epic proportions in the United States of America that in, in turn has an impact on the rest of the world. Do you think that will produce, uh, I mean, how do, how do people react to that politically? Do they, do they, uh, do they take to the streets or do they, will they vote in November? Uh, I mean, what's what's the mood in that in that in that sense? I mean, see, people are taken to the streets, but we got to do more than that. We need I mean, that is protest. You know, Dr. King said, you know, that's that's the voice of, of people who feel like they're not being hurt. So we must protest. We must vote. But there must be a demand and a consequence for elected officials not delivering. We got to have a layering effect. It is not just any one of these things that are going to turn the tide. But the first thing is we cannot continue to be complicit in our own demise. And I am just absolutely convinced now. Let me use the abortion for one example. Okay, they did absolutely nothing. In Ohio, a 10-year-old girl who was raped and impregnated had to cross the line with her family, go to Indiana to get an abortion. Now, if that was not enough to make these people understand, they at least do a carve-out in the filibuster for role. What else do you what else do you need to move you? But that did not move the one iota. And then they had the pure unadulterated gall to fundraise behind it and raise over $80 million. So Steve, when I say that we must stop being complicit in our own demise, that's one example. Mm. Why would anybody donate to the Democrats? You got Murkowski, you have Collins, you have uh, Cinema, and you have Manchin, all who said, oh my God, we relied to by the current uh, members who are sitting on that Supreme Court. Well, then do something about it, at least minimally, if you guys don't have the courage to do away totally with the filibuster, do a carve out for that. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that, Steve, as you laid out in the intro, what the neoliberals were very good at doing in 2020 is clamping down expectations. So all of those big expectations that we fought for in 2016 on the, on the, on the senator's campaign, now in 2020, it became just get rid of Trump. And so people were fed this steady diet of just get rid of Trump. Don't expect Medicare for all. Just get rid of Trump. Don't expect us to cancel student debt. Just get rid of Trump. We're not going to do anything about climate change. Just get rid of Trump. We're going to war our ways and uh, you know continue to have wars until kingdom come. Just get rid of Trump. Yeah. And so in doing that, they stifled any imagination yeah. that the American people could have about envisioning a world a public policy and America that is better than what it is today and that they deserve better. See, that's the key, Steve. We got to get the American people to understand they deserve better. And once you believe you deserve better, you'll demand better and make Absolutely. sure there's a consequence. Yeah. You said, I mean, the get rid of Trump thing is just the classic lowest common denominator politics, isn't that's it? it. I mean, it's, there's this bad guy, he's really dreadful. And, you know, that's all we need to do. You, you, and he you, had to go. Let me go on the record and say he had to go. Sure. But, yeah, but, but, but our senator, Senator <laughs> Bernard Sanders, was better for yeah, this moment. Absolutely. The, you, you mentioned in there, I mean, the, the filibusters talked about a lot as being a blockage to, to change, uh, to doing anything. And you, you mentioned there about this point about a carve out, just, just for the benefit of uh, uh, mainly British audience. Um, the filibuster is where um, in, in effect, things have to have 60 votes in the Senate in order to go through. Um, and anything with a kind of financial dimension is subject to the filibuster. Um, and I mean, without getting too complicated about it, uh, as I understand it, two in December, there were two examples of the filibuster being waived in order to deal with issues. One was lifting the budget ceiling and the other was from a right wing move to uh, for businesses not to have uh, vaccination uh, rules imposed on them. Um, and so we've got a precedent now for the filibuster being set aside, 
which means that that excuse, if we kind of eliminate the excuses, that excuse is no longer there. Then the other excuse is Manchin. Well, you know, he's only one senator and there's lots of ways in which, you know, we've seen the way in which the democratic corporate machine can work. You've been on the receiving end of it, um, and and, oh, yeah. and it was it was it was it thwarted Bernie's campaign, and and, and yet you know Manchin no no pressure seem it seems to me is being brought to bear on Manchin to kind of come into line. He's able to sabotage the climate change measures, saying it's it's too expensive, it's going to be inflationary. Of course, he doesn't challenge, as you pointed out in the tweet, he doesn't it, he doesn't challenge the burgeoning arms budget, <laughs> but. But, you know, the 300 million for climate change uh, is inflationary. Um, but, but you said in, in, in going back to your point about the Roe v. Wade and the 10 year old girl, you also said in, in one of your tweets that the government could set up clinics on federal land. And it seems to me that, you know, if we had a and this is where, you know, there has to be an outcry, you know, Biden's got to send out some kind of message that he's prepared to do something. I mean, both on climate change, where he could declare an emergency, and on something like that, where he could set up clinics on federal land. I mean, these are viable things, aren't they? Very much so, and they're simple. I mean, this president can still use all the tools in his toolbox. Here we are at the end of July. Yeah. Uh, there's still some time, very little time, but yes, use every tool at your disposal to bring some relief to people in this country and for the love of God and everything that is alive on this earth, let the America should be leading in partnership with other nations to deal with climate chaos. So it just makes no sense not to use the power when you have it. Power is finite. It doesn't last always. And, you know, they, they're saying, go vote, vote, vote. Well, you know what? People voted in 2020. They did. They delivered for the Democrats. Now it's time for the Democrats my party to deliver for the people voting in and of itself is not going to get us out of this because there is no guarantee that the democrats are going to maintain power in november so why not go ham right now and use that mm. power in a way that changes material condition it really makes absolutely no sense uh, to me and so many others that they would not see the state of emergency that we are in in this nation and this world there has to be a kind of transformational initiative doesn't it Medea I, I haven't uh, brought you in yet but the your, your focus is mainly on the, the the peace question and the international situation uh, but obviously the arms budget kind of overlap you know it, it it links the two things together because the United States is is planning to spend 813 billion dollars next year on its arms budget which is 40 percent of global expenditure on uh, the, on arms, on military, 26% um, of the United States accounts for 26% of global GDP and is spending 40% of the world's arms budget. So it's completely out of proportion, even to the big size of the US economy. This is surely a kind of drain on uh, resources. Um, what's your perspective on things, my dear? So I'm glad that you uh, brought up the issue of the military budget because it affects everything in the United States. Uh, if we took a very so small portion of that military budget, we could solve the issue of uh, the student debt crisis. We could solve the issue of the lack of a decent healthcare system in this country. Uh, and we could uh, really address the climate issue, which so many people, especially the young people in this country, thought Biden was going to do. Uh, instead, what we see is uh, half measures and a uh, lack of enthusiasm among the public. And as David can well tell us, we're gonna feel that uh, in November come the elections. I work on the international issues and I can't tell you how disappointed I am in Biden. I mean, I thought that at least the, th the things that he had campaigned on uh, and that were part of the Obama administration would be things that he would do quickly. For example, the issue of rejoining the Iran nuclear deal. I thought that would happen in the first week. He came in and he joined the Paris Peace Accords on climate and he would join the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, here we are over a year later and we might be heading towards a war with Iran. We see him going to uh, Saudi Arabia after he campaigned saying that that was going to be a pariah state and he fist bumps uh, Mohammed bin Salman and what a, an embarrassment 
Um, he uh, uh, a campaign saying that his administration is going to be uh, strong on human rights. Yet when he went to Israel, he did nothing about the killing of an American uh, journalist, Shireen Abu Akleh. Uh, when he gets to Saudi Arabia, uh, nothing about the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, who worked for the Washington Post. And let's uh, bring in the other journalist who he should do something about, uh, which is Julian Assange, uh, still in prison. And uh, you would think that uh, the Biden administration could actually drop those uh, that call for extradition. And I'm in Latin America, where he recently had a summit of the Americas, which was a total disaster, because instead of including all the countries in the Americas, he decided who to include and who to exclude, uh, excluding Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, which led to the president of Mexico saying, well, I don't think I'm going to come, and then that cascaded with others saying they're not coming, and really driving home a message to Biden saying, we're not your backyard, we're not your colony anymore. You can't pick and choose uh, who is in the Americas. And that's a good lesson, but one that Biden has not learned. And in fact, it's just tragic that he is still imposing Trump's policy on Cuba instead of going back to Biden's opening. Uh, it's still a, a, a tragedy that he is following Trump's path of the ridiculous of uh, pretending that Juan Guaido is the president of Venezuela and imposing terrible sanctions on that country. Uh, and I would say in general, uh, his policies internationally have been a tremendous disappointment. If you look at Ukraine right now, why isn't he calling for diplomacy? Why isn't Anthony Blinken uh, meeting with Lavrov constantly until they come up with some kind of solution? Mm -hmm. So Steve, uh, I would say both on the domestic level and the international level, um, there is a lot of disappointment in this country. And uh, unfortunately, the Democrats are gonna take a beating because of it. If, if you read the Democratic platform, the, the promise in there was there was going to be more emphasis on diplomacy and less emphasis on the military budget. But in practice, with Blinken, you seem to have a politician, a, 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 a diplomat rather, Secretary of State, who, who resorts to sanctions and military uh, uh, measures or at least military uh, proposals uh, at the drop of a hat. And he, he, he actually, I can't think of any example where he's actually gone out there anywhere in the world and tried to solve a problem through negotiation and diplomacy. I might, might be wrong, but I can't think of one at all. There's, there's been no kind of initiative to sort of fix some of the confrontations and the trouble spots that exist in the world. I think you're absolutely right. I think that Biden brought people in like Anthony Blinken, uh, who really should be, if anything, uh, in the Defense Department. Uh, they are doing nothing for diplomacy. Uh, in fact, they're making the world more dangerous. And in the midst of this uh, proxy war that we have with Russia right now, uh, they're continuing to talk about China being the biggest enemy and justifying this colossal uh, Pentagon budget uh, because we have this other enemy, China, that we have to prepare for. So um, while the world is desperate to end the wars, uh, to move us into a uh, world where we're working together to end the pandemics, to address climate change. I am just absolutely astounded uh, that somebody like Anthony Blinken uh, doesn't have the moral courage to do this. And they're more thinking about how are they going to be criticized by the uh, Republicans and by the hawks in the Democratic Party if they make a simple move uh, like rejoining the Iran nuclear deal, for example, instead of, instead of taking us constantly to the precipice of more wars and keeping the war in Yemen going while there's a, mm -hmm. a short-term truce right now. The only thing that Biden has done is a language uh, play on words of saying, instead of offensive weapons, we are selling defensive weapons to the Saudis. Uh, so Blinken has uh, been a, uh, a hawk in the administration and Biden has done nothing to fulfill that promise of using diplomacy to solve the world's problems. D David and Nina, it, it strikes me, I, you know, take your pick, whichever one of you wants to come in on this first, but I, I tend to feel that the progressive caucus in Congress doesn't have much appetite for uh, tackling this issue of the arms budget and the 
uh, the foreign policy issues. They tend to shy away, away from those issues. Um, and yet the arms budget is such a big thing that when you've got Manchin saying, you know, 300 million on climate change is inflationary, but no one is talking about the 800 billion on, uh, sorry, 300 million billion on climate change and 813 billion on the arms budget. Uh, no one's talking about that being inflationary. I mean, why is why do we not see more noise coming from pe people in the progressive caucus on on this issue? Do you think, David? Do you, you know, you know, I think, I think. Look, I think there's people like Mark Pocan, and there's a there's a core group that that push uh, that perennially uh, push for cuts to the defense budget. I mean, we're, we're now watching Congress push through uh, record increases in the defense budget. Um, and I, I just think, look, I think it goes to the fact that there's, there really isn't much of an appetite uh, inside the Democratic Party to challenge the Democratic president. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think it really, I mean, I think that's Democratic Party culture right now is extremely top down. Uh, it is extremely deferential to uh, the party hierarchy and the party leadership. Uh, and so I, I, I don't think it's just that the Progressive Caucus isn't interested in the, in the Pentagon budget. I think it's something much bigger. I think it's that, I mean, you had a situation where there was this complicated deal to keep the uh, infrastructure bill connected to the social spending bill. Biden's social spending bill, the idea being that to keep them connected, to keep them linked up, would force conservative Democrats to vote for the whole package. And when Biden and the White House and the Democratic leadership moved to break that deal and say, all right, let's split off the infrastructure bill, um, the Progressive Caucus only man mustered six total votes uh, against the standalone infrastructure bill. Right. So in other words, the, the Progressive Caucus only mustered six votes uh, uh, to challenge the, uh, the, the, the White House. And I think that speaks to the fact that rank and file Democratic politicians are not comfortable challenging uh, or really um, causing any kind of inconvenience mm -hmm. for uh, their party hierarchy. Uh, and so I think on every issue, that is the dynamic, that that vote where we only saw six people vote for it or vote against it, excuse me, that was the kind of test of how much appetite there is in the entire uh, Democratic caucus to do something that the White House didn't want them to do. And that's not very much appetite. And I don't know when that's going to change. Uh, I don't know how that's going to change. It's shocking that it hasn't changed yet, considering the uh, the intensity of the crises that the world faces. I mean, look at the, the climate issue as an example. Um, but but to my mind, that culture of deference is fundamentally uh, at at the heart of these problems. Yeah, I think you had a you had a phrase, didn't you, that. Um, Democratic, we need to make democratic politicians fear democratic voters. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, uh, and and yeah. in the way that Republicans worry about their base. Um, yes, exactly. And, Nina, yeah. do you want to? Do you want to? See, come just to add to, yeah, I mean, David hit the nail on the head when he said not willing to cause inconvenience to some of the most powerful people in the world, and that is a foundational point. You know, the great novelist James. Baldwin had a quote, I'm just paraphrasing him on this, because he critiqued this country uh, because of its lack of love and respect and deference to Black people, the second class citizenship. And he talked about, he said, you know, something like, I love this country more than any other, and that is why I reserve the right to criticize it. <laughs> so I'm paraphrasing, we need yeah. to take that same spirit. You know, those of us who are the true freedom fighters who really believe in the essence of the Democratic Party to a certain extent, Steve, I don't want to go all the way back because all the way back we get uh, to, you know, Dixiecrats and racism and all of that. But let's just go on and go to FDR. Let me just start there because I don't want to go all the way back as a, as a black woman. But even if we just went as far back as the spirit of FDR, you know, who challenged whole systems, who even as a wealthy man himself understood what was happening 
in the 30s and in the 40s and how absolute power corrupts absolutely and how the money class, the oligarchs, the ruling class wanted it all and didn't want working class people and poor people to have anything. And he said, I welcome your hatred. And he challenged time and time again. Was he perfect? Absolutely not. Nobody on earth is perfect. But he did have a heart and a willingness. And let me throw in Eleanor, too, the first lady, who was the first activist first lady this country ever had. They, they both had a willingness to challenge systems, to challenge norms, to shake things up. And as Professor Harvey K. always reminds us that there was a survey, a poll done in the 1940s as FDR recognized what was happening in World War II and what the people really needed. He said, we need, a, we need an economic bill of rights. We're going to have those things. So the very essence of what the progressive movement in the 21st century is fighting for, and we got to add some 21st century dynamics to it, is in fact what FDR was pushing uh, before he, you know, before he died. And there is nothing new under the sun. But the difference is that he was willing to use the power of the presidency to shake things up. He saw the needs of the people. And he said what people have a right to, what they deserve, healthcare, education, a system that helps people who cannot work, you know, he deserve economic bill of rights, not a maybe, please, might, it is what they deserve to have. He also talked about the fact that you can't have true freedom if you don't have economic freedom. So to David's point about not willing to cause inconvenience, we have a problem, and this is turning into cultish behavior as far as I'm concerned. We talk about the cultish behavior of the Trump supporters. Let's go on and lay it on out there about the cultish behavior of mainline neoliberal Democrats that if you say anything against them, and not really against them, it's for the people. What we're talking about today, we're speaking for the people who have the greatest need. And I'm sick of coddling folks who have the most important, the highest titles in the land, some of the most privileged people in the world. We've got to coddle them. Let me tell you something. I have more expectations of my two-year-old and my one-year-old grandchildren than we do of these grown, entitled, title-wearing folks who are not willing to sacrifice for the people that they took an oath of office to serve. Here's a thought. Um, you, you were talking there about previous, you know, talk, talking about uh, leaders like uh, Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, who were prepared to kind of push the boat out and, and give leadership. Um, but one of the paradoxes is, if you look, if you look back, that uh, Johnson um, was willing to push the civil rights legislation through, but was <laughs> I don't think that was a, a sign of Johnson's virtue. I think that was a sign of the fact that there was a mass movement that was relentless and that was not going to let go of that issue. And it got to the point right. where um, people like Johnson realised that this was unsustainable. They had to they had to kind of sort out the civil rights issue because, uh, you know, African-Americans weren't going to let go. They weren't going to give up. And liberal America was allied to them. Working class America was allied to them. So this takes me, I'm, I'm saying that because I think the, the next question really is, you know, how do we build that kind of pressure? You know, how do we make democratic leaders fear democratic voters and not just democratic voters, but, but the people generally? Um, and let's, let's start by, uh, I mean, there's two aspects to this, I think. One is, you know, mass movements, trade union organizations, the peace movements so on. Uh, and the other is the, the question of the political alternative, the political challenge. Let's deal with that first. Um, it was very interesting, your, your podcast, um, David, about at state level, we're seeing, uh, we've seen some development of third party options. You, you had a working families party guy on uh, from New York and you had a guy from Vermont, the progressives in Vermont. Does that amount to enough to uh, really challenge the, the democratic machine? Or are we still in a world where the name of the game is kind of working within the Democratic Party on the, in the way that our revolution and Bernie Sanders, you know, that that movement has tried to kind of uh, work within the Democratic Party framework, get people nominated and uh, elected? Or is it a bit of both? I don't know. What, what do you think, David? What's your perspective on well, that? Well, I mean, look, I, 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 I think that there's, 
a need for all of it. There's a need for third party organizing. There's a need for uh, more effective uh, and stronger fusion parties. Fusion parties meaning parties that sometimes run against the major parties, other times they work with the major parties, and there's a need to reform the Democratic Party. I don't think that uh, reforming the Democratic Party is impossible. I mean, I think it's difficult, but I think that it is still, uh, it is still a place, uh, it is still an organization uh, that can be, can be changed, but it's going to take, and it has taken a lot of work. So I guess my, my, I think that there's been some people ascribe a kind of a religious fervor uh, to either working inside the Democratic Party or working on third party uh, uh, organizing. The idea being that if you're not working on, on third party organizing, it must mean you're a sellout to the Democratic Party. And then inside the Democratic Party, if you're working to change the Democratic Party, if you're working on the outside and on, on third parties, it's your uh, sort of an apostate uh, to the Democratic Party and its, its tribe. I just don't subscribe to any of that. I'm, I'm, I'm tactically agnostic. Uh, I, I, and, and I think all of it needs to happen. Uh, I think, but, but I, I will say this, we shouldn't underestimate uh, the Democratic Party in this way. Look, the Democratic Party is terrible at passing good legislation. It's terrible at defeating Republicans in general elections. Um, it is terrible at delivering a compelling message. Uh, but it is good at one thing. It is good at stopping uh, challenges to uh, its leadership from within the party. That's <laughs> its expertise. That's its specialty. Um, it's terrible at everything else, but that is what it is. It's kind of sort of like a, uh, in, in American football, it's sort of like uh, the kicker. The kicker is not very good at really anything, but a good kicker is really good at one thing. And that's what the Democratic Party is really, really, really good at, which is stopping uh, uh, those who want to change the party and make it do better at those other things. And so that power cannot be underestimated. Nadir, you, you, you've you been outside the Democratic Party, I think, or you, you were a candidate for the Green Party. Are you still involved in, in that, or is your focus more on, uh, on Code Pink and the other stuff you're doing? Well, first, I want to say I totally agree with David. Um, personally, I try to keep a uh, my hands in the different pots to see what's going to uh, percolate. Uh, I'm part of Progressive Democrats of America. I'm part of uh, uh, the Green Party. I'm part of a movement for a People's Party. Uh, I want to see a third party challenge. <clears throat> I, I, I mentioned I'm here in Mexico and all over Latin America. You've seen countries that have busted through their two party systems when people thought it would never happen. And all of a sudden it happened. Uh, like the president of Mexico coming uh, in a brand new party called Morena. So it can happen. You know, uh, history is, is not linear. Uh, but I agree with David that we don't know what's going to happen. And um, we, we have to uh, encourage it all. And, uh, you know, David, you brought up a, a vote that happened in the Democratic Party. I just uh, uh, feel compelled to bring up a vote that happened on Ukraine when there was not one Democrat, not one, that challenged $40 billion to keep a war going when there's no plan for diplomacy. Uh, and we didn't have the Barbara Lee that was the uh, lone vote that challenged the war in Iraq. Um, so to have a moment where the Democrats inside Congress um, are so uh, muted when it comes to challenging their own president and um, to see how that deflates the movement within the Democratic Party, to see Nina Turner running for office, the greatest candidate that you could have. I was so excited about having Nina's voice in, Parliament, in, in the Congress. And then to see uh, this outside money coming in and how that so distorts our elections and how broken our system is um, that, yes, we need to be inside trying to find ways and we need to be outside. And when I say outside, I also say we need to form grassroots movements that can go after uh, these new uh, entities that have formed like APAC. 
uh, now having its own C4 that is actually throwing money at Nina's campaign to defeat her, throwing money at Donna Edwards' campaign in Maryland to defeat her on an issue. Uh, they're coming from the Israel issue, but it has nothing to do with that. They want to defeat progressives. And so in this broken system, we have to look for any ways that we can uh, to try to defeat it and try to let something new spring up that would be more beneficial uh, than this dysfunctional system we have right now. I think a lot of people uh, outside the United States don't fully appreciate what a tightly controlled system the uh, the U US politics is. I mean, there's, there's, there's two things. One is the money that you've spoken about, the, the, the way in which big money uh, influences everything. Uh, and then the other part of it is, is actually the 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 legal side of it the way in which and it varies from state to state i know but how difficult it is for third parties to get on the ballot uh, in different states you have to have a huge number of signatures and you know uh, it's a big rigmarole just to even get on the ballot um and and i i, I got to use this because it's one of my all-time favorite quotes but julius nereri famously said the us is a one-party state but with typical american extravagance it has two of them, and and that you know this is this is so true. The you know I, I think you called them the country club Republicans, David, and the corporate Democrats um, ha have a common vested interest in preserving this two party situation, and then kind of being able to trade off with each other about things and blame each other for things, but all the time kind of keeping keeping control between each other. Um, it seems to me an immensely difficult thing to, to, to break out of, but on a positive note, the Bernie Sanders, you know, did manage to, to kind of challenge the machine. And he did manage to raise a hell of a lot of money from literally, I think, millions of people. Uh, Nina, you were very much part of that. And I think, you know, that does show the possibility, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I mean, David and I, you know, been on this journey. I mean, David has been with the Senator far longer than I have. and just been in different iterations um, to see what Senator Sanders was able to, to do, especially in 2016, he did lay a very 21st century, uh, I, I mean, to me, that was the burgeoning of the 21st century version of the progressive movement, this reemergence of it. And the American people did start to imagine, especially younger people from all racial or ethnic, you know, identities really started uh, to believe that we could actually have better than what we have right now. That piercing, that prick, that, that, you know, that piercing of that bubble did flow into 2020, even though it was, it was, it was crushed, but it did flow into 2020. I mean, everything about the 2020 uh, election was animated by the issues that were lifted by the Senator and our campaign in 2016. I mean, who would have been talking about Medicare for all in such a robust way? You know, who would have been talking about paid medical leave who would have been talking about lowering the cost of prescription drugs had it not been for Senator Sanders and you know people like myself, David, Madeira, others, millions of us, because our campaign was really not me, us, but you do have to have a central person, a leader in that way. And to use the imprimatur of the presidency of running for president, that was the key to have that kind of um, power that thrust behind you that could bring millions of people. And he did show that you can raise money one small dollar at a time, that you don't have to answer to the owner donors, that you can compete. I mean, people thought our campaign was out of our minds. Never did they think that the senator, that we were going to be able to raise as much money as we did to be able to go head to head and in some cases raise even more money, you know, on the grassroots side. There is an awakening. I mean, we just got to keep shaking, you know, making sure that the sleeping giants awake and that people understand that it is their power. In America, politicians have done, and not all, but far too many, they've done a really good job of convincing the people of this nation that one, they don't deserve much, and two, that it's not their power. And what we must do is to remind people that for every person that you elect to office, that is your power that you are loaning to them temporarily to do your bidding. And so if they're not doing your bidding, it doesn't matter how popular they are, it doesn't matter how much you like them personally, their swag, the bottom line becomes, are they doing anything to change your material conditions and that of 
the things that you love. And if they are not, they have to be challenged and pushed to do the right thing. And then if they don't do the right thing, they got to go. So we cannot continue to fall in so in love with politicians that we don't hold them accountable. These are policy choices. Poverty is a policy choice. Having the war machine is a policy choice. Not um, voting in the, 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 the John, Congressman John Lewis Voting Rights Act, policy choice. Not having the George Floyd uh, bill, policy choice. Not codifying Roe, policy choice. Not lifting the federal minimum wage, policy choice. Not canceling student debt, policy choice. So we can make different choices. So if all of those things are policy choices, that means that we can do the reverse and take different positions, have different choices, and we can turn this thing around. So if this has been a really interesting discussion. I hope everybody who's listening to it is, uh, is finding it as interesting as I am. To, to finish now, I, I'd just like each of you to, to give your thoughts on what, what you think might be the kind of pivotal issue, an issue that might really ignite that kind of feeling that you're talking about, or maybe it's two or three issues, and, and, and how that might happen. I mean, what, what are the, th the demands that the, the left should be focusing on, do you think, in if you had to say your top two or three? I know it's a bit invidious because there's so many issues, but, uh, but, but Medea, do you want to start off and say what you think um, you know, you see as something that might be pivotal and might just galvanize people in the way that perhaps, you know, the civil rights movement and the, you know, the, the anti-Vietnam War movement did in the 60s. Uh, is, is there something that could be a catalyst for change like, like that in the present situation? Well, I'm very fearful about what's going to happen in these congressional elections coming up in November and how the right and the Trump supporters are not going to recognize uh, the validity of elections in various locations. And I am hoping that, that if that happens, that that's going to spark an uprising among uh, not just Democrats, but independents and even non-voters uh, to say we will not allow our system to be, um, uh, to be hijacked uh, and we don't want to see a civil war in this country. I mean, it's, it's a very dangerous situation, I think. Uh, and so um, uh, I uh, feel like in the lead up to these elections, uh, we have to really build our movements, whether it's the movement for uh, women's choice uh, and responding to this horrible Supreme Court decision, uh, whether it's the push right now to say our climate is burning and we really need to galvanize uh, to seriously address that problem, or whether it's seeing us moving further to a brink of a direct war with Russia, which could lead us to a nuclear confrontation. I think all of these movements have to be building up, um, but I um, somehow feel that this is going to come to a head in November and that those of us who uh, as dysfunctional and as, um, uh, uh, as um, uh, uh, directly, um, critical we are of the system we have right now, um, recognizing that it could be hijacked uh, by this right-wing white nationalist movement. I think that is uh, the point at which perhaps we will come together to not only save uh, what we do have, but to move us into a much more uh, democratic state where we demand uh, that our government, no matter who is in power, start using our funds uh, and our energy and our know-how as a uh, country to really address the needs that we have in terms of climate, in terms of healthcare. Uh, when people are asked, what are their top issues? You know, I work on foreign policy. It's like down at the bottom if, it, if it's even there. People care about economy, economy, economy. And the way that we can address people's real needs uh, is by taking the money that we are using for things like war, pouring it into people's needs and demanding that our government really uh, represent what we, the people, deserve. Thank you, thank you very much. David, what are your, what are your final thoughts? Look, I think that it's hard to, you know, pick out one issue or two issues and, and 
say that the the left whatever and again whatever that term means I, i'm i'm no longer uh clear on what what the american left actually is or isn't but i think uh uh not to sound despondent about it uh but i i think that if we can't muster a political uh, movement and political pressure to deal with climate change uh at this moment then i'm not really sure I mean, one, the earth is not going to, the, the people of the earth, living things on the earth are, are just not going to survive. Mm. So if, if we're simply unable to muster that, uh, then I don't think much of anything else really matters. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the, you know, I mean, w- what other issue could possibly be bigger than that? The only one I could think of that's at least connected to that is, um, is kind of money and politics. Money and politics is linked to every issue. Climate is basically linked to every issue. So to my mind, um, a a movement to uh, remove money's power from our politics and a movement to deal seriously with the climate crisis are the just dwarf everything else. Uh, And and I, I will say, I think we need to be honest about what the kinds of things that might need to be done on climate. I mean, we're looking at science that's telling us that unless we start to take carbon out of the atmosphere, unless we start to use technologies uh, that very, very quickly reduce carbon emissions, uh, that we're not going to have a a livable planet. Uh, It used to be, if we were addressing this crisis 20, 25, 30 years ago, the changes that would need to be put in place uh, could be much more gradual. Uh, I've heard it likened to a ski slope, that, that, it, that what the ski slope used to look like in terms of what we needed to do for carbon emissions reductions was like a green circle, like an easy bunny hill. Yeah. Now it's a double black diamond, what we need <laughs> to do in terms of, of, of what that slope looks like in terms of, of, of the kinds of things we need to do to reduce carbon emissions. And I think it's going to take us all out. It needs to take us and it will take us all out of our comfort zones, whether we like it or not, because if we just sit here, keep continuing with the same politics, doing the same thing, uh, we're going to be brought out of our comfort zone in a, in a particularly negative way as well. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that this is a moment where if we can't be radical, if we can't get serious uh, about what needs to be done, we are essentially giving up on the survival of the human species and not the survival of the human species in a thousand years or 10,000 years, but the survival of the human species, uh, if not within our lifetime, then certainly within our children's lifetime and our grandchildren's lifetime. And if that's not enough to motivate people, if that's not enough to wake people up, uh, then, then, then I, I, I don't really know what to say. I guess I, th- 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 that's basically us giving up on our entire species and our entire world. I don't accept that. Uh, and, but I, I will tell you that I'm certainly frustrated and perplexed uh, that it seems lots of people are willing to accept that. Uh, it's, it's disturbing. I feel like I'm trapped on a spaceship with, uh, you know, we're hurtling through the, va- the vast vacuum of space, the life support systems on fire. There are some of us who are like, we got to fix the problem. And we're trapped with people who've locked themselves in the cockpit and don't care. Mm-hmm. And if, if those of us who were trapped on the spaceship too, can't get radical about that, then we're okay with just floating off into the vast vacuum of space and perishing. I'm not okay with that. But my hope is, is that the younger generation that has even more stake in this, because they're going to live through the worst of this, that they are going to look at the failures of our generation and say, that's unacceptable. That's where I draw my hope is that Folks, you can see it now that, that folks are deeply unhappy with what's going on, people who were younger, uh, and, and rightly so. And my hope is, is, that, is that as folks who don't care effectively age out, there will be enough time and enough people who were younger uh, uh, who really are, know that we need to get radical about this, who are willing to take the kinds of actions that are going to be necessary. Well, 
There certainly is. I mean, I think in this country, it's a similar picture where, you know, young people are very angry and switched on to the climate change issues. But of course, you've got that um, pushback now from the climate change deniers, although they conceal that they're really climate change deniers, using the argument of the economy to, uh, you know, as, as Manchin did over, over the th 300 million pounds on climate change measures. And it seems to me the Green New Deal um, was, a, was a great way of kind of positioning the climate argument and connecting it to the jobs argument. Um, and I mean, do you feel that that still is something that, that we ought to be really um, really stressing that that there is a way forward here, especially in the richest country in the world. Look, actually... I, I, I mean, I, I will tell you this: the one other small glimmer of hope that I have is that this is not a technological problem. This is this is a political problem. That we don't need necessarily a stroke of magic to do uh, what needs to be done to at least start addressing the problem. We have the technologies right now. We are just refusing to be serious about implementing them. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember um, uh, during the height of the financial crisis that uh, in those very, very dark days when the economy seemed to be uh, completely imploding and collapsing, within uh, just a few days, within a few days, the Congress and the president uh, immediately acted to write a giant check for, I think it was a trillion, uh, 700 billion or 800 billion trillion dollars, plus what the Fed did. So, and with, the, with counting what the Fed did, it was about $13 trillion. The point being that within a week of the richest people on the planet feeling any kind of nervousness about their prospects, the entire government was mobilized uh, in an unprecedented way, in a way that I didn't particularly support, but it was uh, mobilized very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. So we know that our government and the governments of the world in certain uh, situations can be mobilized very, very quickly to do a lot very, very fast. The so, so what I am optimistic about is we have the technology to deal with the climate crisis. We just need a political system, a, a set of human beings to make the kinds of decisions that are needed to mobilize that technology. And we are very far away from having that. And that's what's scary, but that's also what's optimistic because what it tells us is, is that if we do what needs to be done politically, we have the tools, the weapons in this proverbial war on climate change, we have the weapons to win the war, to actually succeed and to save our planet. It's just a political problem. It sounds to me like the, the demand for a, Biden to declare a climate emergency should be absolutely kind of repeated. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, the, yeah, you know. yes, but I mean, think about, I mean, I, I keep going back to it, like, he's still out there saying he's not sure he's going to declare an emergency. Like, how much more proof do you need that it's an emergency? Yeah. Like, what? What is wrong with you? Like, why is like I I was marveling at the fact that that all these reporters in Washington are writing that he may declare and oh it's a big scoop that he's considering declaring and I'm like what the hell is wrong with these yeah. people in Washington are, are you know the reporters the pundits they're normalizing the idea that it, it's like it's 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 perfectly normal and fine for the president to look at the world literally on fire and say hey I'm not really sure yet I'm ready to declare an emergency yeah. like that's completely messed up and and I think. From a movement perspective, the, the necessity is to take those moments where Joe Biden is looking like a completely uh, out of touch, uh, completely um, uncaring person looking out at the climate and the planet on fire, saying he's not yet ready to, to declare an emergency, that those moments need to become opportunities to say, yeah. look at what is going on. Look at this government. Look, and it's not just to pick on him. It's the, it's government wide. Look at this kind of moment. This is the problem. The problem isn't just carbon emissions. It's this, and this we can change. Mm. Nina, I'll give you the, I'll give you the final 
final word well, from you. My two colleagues, my two colleagues laid it down. I mean, this is truly art imitating life. So I, I, all the while David was talking, I was thinking of don't look up. I mean, that is it. Yeah. I mean, we are in that moment where these people are so out of touch. It's so delusional and, and they believe they got an escape. So the rest of us, you know, poor folks, marginalized people, let, let them stay here and suffer. You no, know, the entire ecosystem that depends on human beings to do the right thing mm. is in peril, is in trouble right now. And it is about political will. And we need not just the American people when it comes to the climate chaos, because this is something we have to deal with as a world. We need the people of the world. That's, I mean, I can visualize that. I can see that in my mind's eye, that we have a international movement of people who are going to make a collective demand about what we will do and must do about climate chaos. So I have a quote to, to end this out. And this is Terry Tempest Williams. The eyes of the future are looking back at us and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. This is, I mean, like David laid out, I mean, for the love of God, if we're not going to do it for ourselves, could we at least do something for generations that cannot act on their own, both the younger children who are walking this earth right now and the generations who are not born? Can we do it for an ecosystem that can't do it? Because we're supposed to be the shepherds of this earth and treat, the, see, Mother Earth is going to be okay, Steve. Mother Earth is going to outlast us. Yeah. We're not going to be okay. Yeah, the dangers the where the dinosaurs. Of this earth. Right. The, M Mother Earth is going to outlast us, but we're not going to be okay. And so if this climate chaos and all the things that are connected to it, as Medea and David said, this is all about the money. Follow the money. This is really what this is about. The inaction by our government here in the United States of America, your government in, in, in Great Britain, you know, the entire UK, all that, Europe, just name it, whatever continent we're, we're on. When things are not happening that move in concert to lift human, humanity, follow the money. So that's what this is all about. It is about the money. And we have got to deal with that. And we have got to elect people to office to use the power. who are going to use that power in a way that edifies and that lifts. And they're not going to be sitting back playing checkers while, or fiddling, that's the best one, while literally Rome is burning. Yeah. Well, on that warning, with an optimistic tinge that... There are people out there who are angry about this and, and let's hope we can galvanise that movement to make the political change that's needed. But uh, on, on that note, we're going to have to draw this to a close. It's been a real privilege hearing the three of you talk about these issues. And I, I think I probably speak for everybody listening that uh, it's been insightful to, to uh, insightful and inspiring to hear three, three activists like yourselves talk about the US situation and to know that in, in the States there are people who are uh, leading this fight and many others. Um, and and the, the, the Bernie Sanders, I mean, to finish on the note I started, the, the inspiring scene I saw in Los Angeles on the 1st of March with 25,000 people, which I've posted on Twitter, uh, those people aren't going anywhere, are they? They are still there. That that potential is still there. And it, you only have to see that, that room full of people and listen to Bernie, it's a short clip, to, to feel a kind of buzz of excitement. And I think that's the hope for the future, that we can, we can build on that movement that uh, was there. Thwarted as it was then, um, it can't be thwarted forever. Um, and, and I think we need to, um, I think we need to uh, look to the future and, 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 and see that, those foundations being built on. So thank you, the three of you, so much for this. It's been very good, very enjoyable, and very interesting. Um, and you never know, maybe we can pick it up again after the midterms and see where we've got to. Um, hope, hopefully some progress. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's been great being on with you. Thank you.